again from the studios of Four Wheels Good, the weekly programme that keeps you ahead of events around the world of motoring. On this week's show, we take a Highland trip in the celebrated 1.6 litre Hyundai Coupe. Stephen Vokens takes a soft option for his car with a new portable garage, and master mechanic John Wright buries his head under more bonnets. But first, as we've shown you in previous weeks, there are many ways of getting into the world of motor racing. The very first level is go-karting, and Richard Warren has been taking a spin. no doubt that most of the current crop of Formula 1 drivers started their careers in go-kart racing and people who haven't raced a go-kart will not understand really the, the difference between learning how to drive a go-kart and then going into a Formula 1 car. But today we're looking at indoor go-karting and a way that you can very cheaply get into a go-kart, have some fun and learn how to drive competitively at the same time. And this is the sort of go-kart that people come down to drive. So for as little as about £25 you can actually get out and have a race with some of your friends. So this is probably the best way of actually finding out if you like motor racing or not. And then if you want to take it a step further, you can follow us up through some of the race schools in England which we'll be doing in future programmes. At the moment we're in speed karting is uh, indoor go-kart stadium in Warrington and I'm with Joe Dean who's the circuit manager. Well Joe, what is the best thing to do if you want to come into a go-kart stadium like this? Well the first thing to start off with I suppose is what we do, arrive and drive, where you just generally turn up and you pay for your laps around the circuit. Available from all years, from four years upwards. And how much is that going to cost you roughly? Starts at £2.50 and then you can stay as long as you want and pay as much as you want. Ah, so it really is quite a good way of finding out if you can handle the cart and then go on to something else maybe a little bit later on. It's certainly the cheapest form of motor racing you're going to get. Right, well, Joe, this is the actual go-kart now. It's obviously a, a fairly standard chassis. Um, what about the actual engine, though? What sort of speeds can th this sort of thing get up to? Well, we had the radar down about three months ago. Down the back straight, bang on 40 miles an hour. It's very quick, isn't it, this, given the sort of height off the ground you are? It is. Uh, two inches off the ground, and it, you feel as though you're low-flying. And obviously, with this, this chassis, it's obviously sort of standard go-kart chassis, but I understand you had quite a lot of um, people saying that it's very, very good for handling. It's been developed over the years by the particular company that make this one and over the years, it, without a doubt, shines above everything else. Really is top quality. And have you had many people who've, who've come in here, say, as a beginner and actually gone on to race and go-karts or not? I now go down to the local circuit and probably recognise half the people down there as beginners from our indoor circuit. So it's quite a... because obviously people don't realise that the actual characteristics of this go-kart, and I must speak as a journalist here, and the, the guys I know have gone up through motor racing into Formula 1 now, nearly 98% of them have started off in go-karting, so uh, it speaks to itself, doesn't it? It's a superb stepping stone, and it's cheap as well, so they actually come down, but once they get the bug, once it bites, they've got to go further. It's uh, good racing at this level. The other question I've got to ask, people ask it of me as well, when you're actually racing these things, you've got maybe five or six carts in it in a very tight situation, if somebody does take a spin, um, it's not really that painful, is it? Because if you go over, it's, uh, you've got your crash and you've got your overalls. Um, what normally happens on a, a normal racing line? Well, <laughs> that's a killer. A normal racing line, if somebody spins, we, we have the beauty of having a very wide circuit, as I said earlier on, so you should be able to avoid the spinners in front of you. If there is impact then obviously the side pods uh, take absorb most of the shock 
people can get hurt as it motor racing is a dangerous sport and at 40 miles an hour if you take a full impact it can be rather uncomfortable but most incidents occur on the corners themselves where the speeds are down to 15 20 25 miles an hour so relatively safe but we're only talking about a small percentage of that it's very unusual to have something like that happen because most people are aware of what's going on and they're not all lunatics are they well, no, they do. <laughs> not, not all. They do have a full safety briefing before they go out on the circuit, and obviously we make everybody aware that we want to keep the event as close to motor racing as we possibly can. They're not bumper cars. They're not designed as bumper cars, as you can see. We know they're not professionals out on the circuit. There's going to be that little bit of contact, but we have to run a safe, tight ship, and that's what we aim to do. Of course, the big difference about this sort of uh, type of indoor sport is the fact that you're really out on your own. Once you've actually been through that briefing session, you're actually driving the car, you haven't got an instructor with you. And unlike some of the other racing schools we'll be looking at, you're, you're entirely free to do what you want. Well, within the rules and regulations, yes. Um, they, they tend to wait till a faster driver goes past them. They'll latch onto the back of that driver and follow them round. If, if you could close your eyes after practice laps and open them again, 20 minutes later, once they're into the second, third round of racing, totally different drivers. Um, the, the speeds increase, the, the actual ability of the driver comes out, and you get some really good close racing. Karting really is great fun and it truly gives you the basics for a motor racing career. Now if your car sits out in the rain, wind, snow and ice all year, you know that eventually it's going to suffer. Well an enterprising man from the West Midlands has come up with a solution. It is a portable garage with climate control. I don't want to appear nationalistic or anything, but we Brits do seem particularly gifted at inventing things. Take for instance Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of BT or John Logie Baird, inventor of television, or Thomas Crapper. Well, I'll leave you to guess what he invented. More recently, there's been Alex Moulton, the inventor of hydrograph suspension and those weird bikes. Sir Clive Sinclair, who invented lots of good things apart from the C5. And the very latest name to add to this illustrious roll call is Stan Millward. Who? Stan Millward, inventor of the car cosy. Dan, tell me what this futuristic blob is. <laughs> yes, it, we sort of invented it about 18 months ago, and obviously, you know, necessity being the mother of invention, we had a pressing need for a cover for a nice new car, or an old car. I've got one or two cars, um, old and new, and we needed to get them into an environmentally um, protected condition. You can see where we're here with all the trees. And because of the, uh, of the necessity for keeping our cars in the correct condition and to have them immediately available, which is what it's all about, um, I suddenly thought of this idea and then began some 18 months ago. Um, we, ha we had a DTI grant uh, and a patent to get on with the job and uh, we're now almost at the end of the, the line to get it into production. And we hope that it will be in production something in the next month or two uh, having done a few shows and a few feedback from the public, uh, it's absolutely first class. We think we're going to do the job. It looks reasonably lightweight. What about the winter winds? No, no, we, well, you can see the badges on the front. Uh, it's, it says it's Meyer, and we tested it at the, industrial, at the industry research establishment down in Northampton. And in fact, it came through with flying colours. We had, um, without anything in it, without being pinned down, we actually got um, a wind speed of 75 miles an hour sideways on and it was stable. Why should I buy a car cosy rather than have a garage built? Well, I think there's a lot of ways of looking at a car cosy. First and foremost, simplicity. It, it arrives, you place it on the ground, you put your car inside immediately. You don't need to have any uh, problems with drainage. It's just as your car stands on the drive, so the car cosy does its job. It protects. 
When you put your, your car away and it's wet yes. and, it, and the engine's still hot, yes. surely that's a recipe for rusting if the, if the air can't get out? Well, that's right, and we thought of that uh, on the concept and the onset. And in fact, we now have fan units, one heated, one not heated, and immediately the car comes in and the, and the cover drops to the floor. Those will engage and will take out all of the, the hot air from the engine gearbox and final drive assembly and basically dry the car out. Um, on top of that, the, the specification can also include, or will include for, a dehumidifier so that if you're leaving the car in for any length of time, the fans don't engage. In fact, the humidifier does the job and will exhaust and keep the, the air inside the car cosy dead on. So that's the car cosy. The latest invention from the country that gave you stainless steel, the cat's eye and the widget. So remember, when you see one of these on your street, you saw it here first. Here you are Stan, you can take this, I'm going for a spin. <laughs>
to 6,250 RPM. In order to ensure the highest standards of driving excellence, Hyundai Coupe's suspension was tuned by world-renowned European chassis engineers. They made subtle changes to spring rates and anti-roll bars. They also prompted the use of gas-filled hydraulic dampers. This tuning combines with the power steering to give a balanced handling with the emphasis on sporting pleasure. The main drawback with the new 1.6 compared with the 2 litre is you lose power. But also you have to accept the loss of certain luxuries such as electric mirrors and anti-lock brakes which are optional. It's generally agreed by the motoring world and the public that the Hyundai Coupe is the best car to come out of Korea. The car feels like the 2 litre to drive. It rides well, handles well, but just lacks the crispness that the 2 litre has. Looks wise, Hyundai have made the right decision in using the same shape as the 2 litre. The only way of telling the two apart is that you have steel wheels rather than alloy wheels. All of these factors added together make a car which is a pleasure, if not a buzz, to drive. The acceleration, power steering and road holding are combined to great effect on those wild and winding Highland B roads. Every car which comes into the country at the moment is already sold. If the 1.6 follows the sales direction of the 2 litre, you should book now, because they're going to go like hot cakes. A great car there with Luke's power and an economic fuel consumption. Now it's time once again to wing our way over to John Wright and Inside Motors. Take it away, John. Welcome once again to Inside Motors. If you think servicing means garages and big bills, then think again. Today we're going to do a service on a Volkswagen Polo, but first we've got to buy the bits. Come on, let's go and get them. Hi Frank, see so you've got the bits for the Polo. Hi John, yeah, got them out ready. Uh, you've got your oil filter, air filter, plugs, ignition bits, you've got your distributor cap and rotor arm, all ready to go. go. Great stuff, um, how about some oil? Oh yeah. There we go, there's the oil. Great stuff. There we are, see, it's as easy as that. The servicing of modern cars is relatively easy. In fact, as cars have got more complex, the servicing requirements have got more simple. Today we're going to service this Volkswagen Polo. No magic formula, all the details are held in the book. Here we are, service schedule, passenger cars. There are actually two services for the Volkswagen. There's a lubrication service every 10,000 miles and an inspection service every 20,000 miles or 12 months, whichever comes the sooner. What we're going to do today is the inspection service and we're going to add to it a lubrication service as well. For the lubrication service, all you need is the oil filter and the can of oil. And for the inspection service, we need to replace the spark plugs and the air filter. And then everything else that we do is inspect this, check that, check leaks here and check tensions. Right, let's get on with it. Right, we've jacked the car up, loosened the wheel nuts. Now we're going to drain the oil out of the sump and get it changed. OK, now comes the lie down bit. Right, this is the sump drain nut here. I'll just get a 90mm spanner on it, take that off. Loosen it. There we go. And just let the last few dregs go. And pop the nut back in again. Tighten it up. I always like to tighten them up. Immediately I've done the job. It means you don't forget. And that's it. Right, now we're under here. I think we'll just change the oil filter as well, which is this device immediately above. 
You can actually get at it from the top of the car as well, but seeing as we're down here, we might as well just do it. Put the oil filter wrench around the filter and tighten it up until it loosens off. There we are. Not really a huge problem. Take that off just to catch the drips of oil. Right, here's the new oil filter that we got from BMS. Now, before you fit it, two important points. One, pre-fill a little bit of oil in the filter. Just let it go over the top and lubricate the seal. That's all that cleaned up the new one back on. Just before I fit it, what I want to point out is that these two, fil these two filters are of different sizes. Normally that would make a difference, apart from the fact that I do know that Volkswagen have changed the specification on oil filters and they've gone for a smaller spec one. So I know that that one's correct, even though I've taken that huge one off. Let's see if we can get this in with it. That's it. There we are. Now the filter face has just contacted the block and it needs three quarters of a turn to tighten it up. There we go. As viewers of Inside Motors will know already, I like to put the oil in in a jug. Uh, it's especially important with cars like this that have catalytic converters because if you overfill the sump, you risk serious damage to your catalytic converter. Right, I've just popped two litres in there and I'm just going to see where it comes up to on the dipstick. Right, it's just popped about halfway up the uh, max and min mark. We'll just put a little bit more in, I think. Right, there we go. We'll see John again next week. Also on next week's show, we're at Alton Park with John Cleland, who'll be driving the latest Vauxhall touring cars. And Stephen Vokens will be on the south coast meeting a man who deals in vintage Ferraris. See you then.